Good morning, Central. Oh, good morning. All right, just remember, you got to be twice as loud since you're covered up, okay? So there we go. Uh, would like to welcome you this morning, those of you who are here and those of you who are online. It is good to have you all with us. Just a reminder that if you are here online, if you would like to just let us know, check in, say something, I would love to know that you're here. Um, you can always leave me a message. I read all that stuff. Believe it or not, Monday morning, um, sit down with the Facebook page and all that kind of stuff and see who was here and who wasn't and who could hear what and how everything went. So, um, announcements for this morning. Tomorrow morning is men's prayer breakfast. I ask that you all um, be here for that if that's, that's your thing. Um, Monday evening, the women are doing their Bible study on Jude. Now, somebody shared that the women can come drop in any time just because you started. Is that, 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 that fair, ladies? Does that work? If you are a woman and you missed the first couple sessions, you just, you just stop on in. They are studying the book of Jude. Um, my Bible study is on Thursday. It is at 6.30. If you need a book, I still have books. We can always get more books. Uh, you will have a week that you need to have read. There are three days this week that you need to read before you come. Uh, if you choose not to read, you're good. So anyway, um, you know, you can, <clears throat> however much you put in is whatever you're going to walk away with. So just like a college course, uh, nobody's going to sit there and check to whether, see whether or not you've read or not. So that's just not how it is. But it is geared that way. If you have the book, um, reading before you get there is always, always a good idea. So this evening... You ready, Matthew? I got you. All right, there we go. Because I may or may not be able to hear you with the mask on. But he, Matthew is preaching this evening at the youth service. So if uh, it is in here, we decided that cold and rainy was not good outside weather for the, for the youth service. So we will be right here and right in this spot. So we will see you all back here for the youth service this evening. Um, what time? Let's see. It's at 6 or 7. Yeah, 6. I don't don't do that to me. <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah, that's, that's 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 too much this morning. Um, sitting here and got to count fingers, man. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, we were. Um, it was just uh, had a flashback with sixes this week. We were watching. Anybody remember who Torval and Dinar were? Our were. Anyway, they did Olympic ice dancing for Great Britain. And they were showing their perfect scores of sixes. That's what made me think of that. And I was, we, were, we were just remembering when that happened. Um, some of you aren't old enough to know who Torval and Dean are, and that's all right. Um, they were Great Britain's last great hope for gold medal at, at the uh, Sarajevo Olympics in 84. So anyway, that's neither here nor there, I suppose. I, um, but that small, small flashback. Are those all the announcements that we have? Um, mission kits. Uh, we are fast approaching the end of April and the mission of the month. They are going to run about $30. They go to Ishinesu, which is a school that this annual conference built in conjunction with Hilltop United Methodist Church in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has experienced all kinds of flooding. I do not believe that the school is damaged. It's kind of up and elevated and on a hill. But that is something that they are all dealing with. So they've had a pandemic and horrible flooding this spring. So um, they are... Um, going to be in desperate need of those school kits. Those kits will take care of uniforms and supplies and all those kinds of things that they, they need for the year at school. It's a residential kind of a thing. Um, most of them come to Ishinesu and stay. Um, it's boarding school. So there you are. That is um, how it works. So if you would do that and then we will gear up for May. I'm not sure where April went, but May is on its way. So um, there we go. Anything else? Anything else? Are we good? All right. If we are good, then I'm going to ask you to stand up and sing just at, well, I'll sing, you'll do whatever you do that I don't ask what you do, which would be just a closer walk with thee. a closer walk with thee, cramped 
with Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. I am weak, but Thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to Thee, just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be, though this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but Thee, dear Lord, none but Thee. a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. feeble life is o'er. Time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely o'er to thy shore, dear Lord, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Day <clears throat> walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. You may be seated. Prayer request this morning. Lee Scannell, how you doing? You okay? Did they give you everything you wanted to know and more? Good news? Bad news? Okay. Test tomorrow. Test tomorrow. All right. Y'all pray for Lee. He's got tests tomorrow. And mostly the tests come out benign, and that is what we are asking. That they come out benign tomorrow, so you all be praying. Mike Yanko is home and doing well and has had surgery. Um, please remember Mary Hildreth and Ann Atkins and Jesse Easterling. Sharon Taylor's sister is not doing well, in case you had not heard and are wondering. Um, Brittany's grandmother, if you just continue to pray for her, and Tim Fisher, we continue to pray for him. I'm assuming not a whole lot has changed. He's having a hard time with this last leg of, of chemotherapy. So if you would just, if any of you have been there, you understand how it gets at the end, and um, it's hard. So, Sandy Hill, you were with us Thursday night at Bible study. I saw you there. Virtually clapping, that's more than I can do. I can't virtually clap. I, I, don't, I don't usually get clapping during Bible study, but Sandy clapped. So, it's, um, even if it's just pictures, Sandy's never clapped in person, just so you know. Um, but she, but she, now that she hides, uh, you know, on the other end of a camera, she'll do it virtually. She'll, she'll sit there and clap. And, uh, and it just isn't uh, disturbing. Uh, Mike Tilly is at home, and he is recovering from surgery, just so that you are aware. Um, my wife and I have, well, my wife has a friend. Um, 
who has had to um, take her children and leave her husband this week and um, with good reason and uh, would ask that you just remember them as they, uh, they uh, start over again and try and put some of the pieces back together. So that's all I'm, I'm going to say, and I would just ask that you would, uh, you would remember them. Uh, sometimes getting all the boxes to work in all the right ways is, um, is not easy. So, so that you're taken care of. Hey, did I catch everything? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's church. That works. Anybody think it's not church? Okay. I had to be careful because I, I served a church, and, and my first Sunday there, they, we did prayer requests. And I had somebody stand up at the back of the church, and they said, well, I want to pray for so-and-so. And somebody got by there, and I said, well, I don't think we ought to be praying for them. They got everything there. And it's like, oh, where have I gone? Anyway, they were going to have a fight break out between the two back pews on whether, what, who we should pray for. So just understand there are other places um, that do things differently. So, alrighty. Anything else this morning? Anybody got any good news besides Matthew preaching tonight that you want to share? Any amazing things? Nothing amazing. Okay. Yes, ma'am. No, that is exciting. All right, just so folks on the internet can hear, Marty, the Joneses have gone on vacation, and I don't even know when the last time they went on vacation was. So 30 or 40 years ago, all right. So I, that's exciting. Jay is uh, living in a group home, in case you weren't aware, and he's, he's doing real well, doing real well. COVID kind of had to... You know, slowed things down a little bit and make sure everybody was healthy when he moved in and that he was healthy when he moved in. So, um, But he is there and he is doing, doing well. I don't know if he's still watching us, but if you are still watching us, Jay, good morning. Anything else this morning? Any other good news, amazing things happening? Uh, So if you're going to the Emmaus board meeting tomorrow night online and I'm not there, you don't need to tell them why I'm not there, but I'm not going to be there. So just uh, uh, 24 years at least warrants dinner out. Um, so with masks and six feet apart from everybody, of course. Um, anything else this morning? Are we all good? All right. Why don't we pray this morning? Oh, gracious God, we come before you this morning reminded that your love never ends and it never gives up. It is always working. It is always there. And your love is not something simply to be admired, but it is something made to imitate. That your never-ending love is to become our never-ending love. And as part of that love, most gracious God, we gather this morning. And with part of that love, we lift our hands and give you praise and thanksgiving for all that you have given to us. We give you thanks for moms and dads and husbands and wives and families. And we are reminded of those who are getting to go on vacation. And we've got some folks who have gotten themselves vaccinated and their kids vaccinated and their grandchildren vaccinated and they are on the road, man, going to see people they haven't seen in 16 months. And so we are excited for them and we pray for them as they go to, to love one another in some very concrete ways that just haven't been possible up until recently. We give you thanks this morning for all the folks who, uh, who worked so hard and so diligently to come up with a vaccine. Um, for the COVID virus, and we give you thanks for those who have made a way and continue to make a way um, for folks to be vaccinated. We pray this morning. We pray for all those whom we have mentioned. There are those who are getting ready to go into the hospital and have some tests, and, and we are praying for them. There are those who are in rehab 
and we remember them as well this morning. There are those who are not in rehab, but who are in rehab, and they're home, but they're trying to get rid of their walkers, and we pray for them as well. We pray for those who are struggling, those who find themselves alone again after all these years, and um, we pray for uh, all those folks who are having to get up and go to work in the morning and have issues and have things that make it very, very difficult. We pray for them this morning. We stop and we pray. We think about the person who is sitting on our right. We think about the person who's seated on our left. And we lift them up before you this morning, O oh God. Because we aren't called to just love anybody. We're called to love the people that we're with. And so we want to specifically name two of them. The people on either side of us this morning. And if there's a hole, God, and we know that somebody should be there and they are not, we're going to pray for them anyway, whether they are here or not. We ask, most gracious God, that the Holy Spirit come among us now, that it move together and bind us together and make us one. We wait this morning. We wait the great 50 days. We wait for Pentecost and the movement of the Spirit. And we remember, O oh God, to pray each day. To pray each day for the coming of the Spirit. And while we wait, O oh God, and while we listen, open our hearts and move through us and move across our people and our nation that we might indeed, um, we might indeed know love that we might give love in the name of the one who is love. Amen. Sing alleluia to the Lord. Sing alleluia to the Lord. Sing alleluia. Sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia to the Lord. All right, the Von Martin family ringers are here this morning. Sorry, it was good enough at the early service. It was, yeah, anyway, so and they're they're here to share with us this morning, and that's all I'm gonna I'm gonna say because their ringing will speak for itself.
So as we prepare for our offertory, you could just be thankful for that alone, and that would be enough. I'm hoping somebody looked at the flocks last week after I talked to you about that. If you haven't looked at the flocks, if you are parked in a parking lot and you have failed to look up, I forget what day it was this week I brought my wife in and we pulled into the, into the parking lot and she looked up and she saw the dogwood all across the parking lot. I am just reminded that no matter what happens in this world, between the flocks and the dogwood, and the bunny rabbits looking for some place to have babies in my garden, and the deer eating my daylilies, there is an inevitability, okay, <clears throat> to the unfolding of spring and the beauty of the world, and that it happens regardless, um, and the will of God happens as well. And it will unfold, and when this is over, um, I suspect it will look something like dogwoods in bloom, or flocks on a hillside, or whatever you call a bunch of baby bunnies that are going to grow up and eat everything you just planted. But they're cute, and you can't deny that. So uh, Dave is going to offer up on our behalf um, some praise and thanksgiving, and you are free to offer up your praise and thanksgiving as well this morning. With a heart full of thanksgiving, would you stand up and become God's sanctuary? You sing sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and 
I am true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary Every time we sing that song, I think of a, a parishioner, and she had been, she's a, a veteran, and she um, sometimes had a hard time grasping things. I was sometimes amazed that she was in the service and, and, and made a go of it, and it was successful. She just, um, just had a hard time grasping lots of things, and um, she was dying of cancer, and her dear brother-in-law wanted to came up to her and wanted to know if she was saved, if she got saved, and if Jesus was her Lord and Savior, and she'd been on her knees, and she'd been, and then her friend Carol called me and said, "You got, you got to talk to her. She's a mess," and she just sat there and cried, and she said, "I just don't know what my brother's talking about," and she said, "All I do." Every day when I wake up is I hand my life over to Jesus. And that's all I can do. And she said, do you think that's enough? And I thought, you know, that's all she could understand. When I say she was a little limited, she was a little limited. And her brother was just, you know, I mean, he had the best of intentions, but he was just, he wasn't doing a lot of listening. And uh, sometimes you need to listen. Um, and we sang that song at her funeral because it was her favorite. And she uh, talked about how that was what she was trying to do with her life. She just wanted God to use her, and he wasn't quite sure how he was going to with, with the cancer. But she just, gosh, I get up every day and I hand everything to Jesus because that's what he told me to do. And uh, sometimes we have to be careful that our language doesn't get in the way of reality. You know what I'm saying? Um, not everybody, not everybody speaks the same lingo that we speak. Speaking of which, we're going to get into First John with some very specialized lingo. Um, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. First John, four, seven, and eight. Anybody know the song? All right, there's three of us. We are not going to sing it for you this morning. This is not, my friends, uh, the love chapter. That would be 1 Corinthians, and that would be Paul. Uh, this is the love letter. And if John 3.16, you all know John 3.16, would you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him right, should not perish but have everlasting life. If that's the first half of the gospel, if that's part one, right, that gets us to heaven, then 1 John 3.16, I would suggest to you, is part two. We know love by this, John writes in his epistle, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So if you're looking for another verse to memorize after John 3.16, Maybe 1 John 3.16 would be the verse for you. There are two ways in this letter as, as John unrolls it before us. There is the way of Cain that we aren't going to talk about today. It is a way of hatred born of selfishness and greed and some ugly self-esteem issues, actually. Or there is the way of Jesus, which we will talk about this morning. And this is a way of love born of self-sacrifice and giving, always keeping the best interests of the other at heart in all that we do. 
Which brings us to our text this morning from 1 John. Third chapter, starting with the 16th verse. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and in action, or as I memorized it, in deed. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another, just as he commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us, which you are all praying for, right, every day. You pray for the coming of the Spirit. I caught somebody this week and I said, so you praying for that? And they looked like a poor deer that had been caught in the headlights. Uh, yep, I'm dead serious about that. Let the world hate, John says prior to these verses, as if the world needed any encouragement. Look around you. There is hate everywhere. All you have to do is look. Anybody disagree with me this morning? Anybody found a lack of hate in the world? Okay, that's why I'm looking at flocks and dogwood, okay, because I'm not finding it there. Let the world hate, says John, as though they needed our permission. The world's hatred proves who they are. And you need to pay attention when the world says who they are. Because Jesus turns to the world. Who is hating him in the book of Acts? You may not have noticed the story as Jesus confronting the world and its attitude of hate, but you know the story. Saul is on the road to Damascus, right? And Saul is doing what? He is persecuting the people of the way, the Christian church. He is taking them and persecuting them and taking them back to Jerusalem. They are being tortured and thrown into prison and taken to that place, those of you who have been to Israel, the torture chamber under the pastor's house. Now, I've been sore tempted sometimes to put a torture chamber under my house, but I never have. And I'm not sure what kind of high priest puts a torture chamber under the place that he lives, but we were there. And it sort of gives a whole different dimension when Paul's out doing all this stuff and he's hauling them all back to put them there. It literally is a hole. And even though Paul is using good words and righteous words and God's words, what Paul is doing is hating them. And in the chapter of Acts, in that chapter of Acts, God confronts the hate of the world, as Saul is practicing it, and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The hate of this world is not part of us and is used to destroy us. Understand that, John says. Understand that. And then John says, but you... You, the church, you should look different. You should be different. Love should show itself everywhere in the church. Now, let's get John's parameters straight. John is talking about loving those people just inside the church in this letter. I want everybody to look at the people who are sitting next to them. Turn around. Everybody look at the person next to you. Everybody do that. Got that? Now look at the people who are in front of you. And look at the people who are in back of you. Keeping six feet distance, of course, at all times. Everybody looked around. 
John is talking about you loving those people. What I discovered in getting ready for this sermon this week is that C.S. Lewis has been quoting me for years. I was so impressed. Lewis maintains that when a Christian says they love everyone, it is often an excuse for not loving anyone. You understand what I'm saying? It's way easy to say, I love everybody. But I have, don't have to worry about you or you or you. That, that's a little on the specific side. It's far more difficult to love people around you in the pews. The people you all just looked at. And I bet sometimes even the people you didn't want to look at this morning. Because they all have foibles and issues. And they aren't perfect. And sometimes they're stanky. Because fortunately we're never stanky. Just them. If you cannot love the people here, John says, hmm, you have to love the people here. There's no hope of loving the people out there. You have to start here. So having said that, John goes on that loving each other is proof of our eternal life. We know that we have passed from death to eternal life because, John says, we love if hate kills, remember Cain and hate and murder and killing is over here and we are on the other side, right? Love, John says, produces what? It produces life. If hate kills and murders, John would say, love produces life. And it is divine love that we show. It is eternal life that will be produced. You do not get to heaven unless you love. You stop and think about that for a minute. I had a friend who was a pastor. And he was married to the ugly, not the ugliest woman physically. I'm telling you internally, she was, she was something else. And one day we were sitting down talking and he said, Don, I got to get over this. Because when I get to heaven... She's going to be there, and I'm going to have to say something, and I don't know what I'm going to say. I got to get over this. My friend said, he was telling me, you got to love what? Everybody. And that was what he was working on, he was finding a way to forgive her and love her even though he couldn't be married to her. Do you all know the fruits of the Spirit, right? Can you say them with me? The fruit of the Spirit are love, joy. No, that's it. We're done. What's the first one? Love. Okay. <clears throat> Abide these three, right? Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So I'm thinking it sounds like Paul and John are in agreement here that love is, in fact, the most important thing. So the evidence that we are Christian at all is that we love our brothers and sisters in the faith. You may say, that's easy, Pastor. Don't we all do that? Don't we just love everybody here all the time? Do we? Do you really want me to get specific from the pulpit? On, I don't think so. Do we all the time? <clears throat> if you love one person in particular, you can't pretend like they don't exist. You can't talk about them behind their back. You can't point fingers and stomp up and down and, and get all mad at it. You can't do those things. You have to love them because Christ, what? First loved you. 
And some people are just harder to love than others. And my wife will tell you that on some days I am harder to love than I am on other days. But John says this is precisely what love proves. Without love, John claims, there is spiritual death. Remember Cain and hate and the murderer. The one who hates, John is going to say, is a murderer. And John's pretty clear on that point. You are a child of Cain if you do not have love. And the essence of love, John is going to say, is self-sacrifice. Love seeks another's good even if it costs. Jesus sought our good, our eternal redemption, even when it cost him not just his life. We all, that all just rolls off our tongue. Well, Jesus gave his life for me, blah, 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 blah. And we just, ba -dum. You remember Holy Week, I talked about the fact that when the Jews got together and the Romans slash Gentiles got together and they planned out the crucifixion, there was a reason they did it the way that they did it because they wanted to make sure that they not only killed Jesus' body and they took that from him, but they wanted to make sure they took his reputation from him, his good name from him, his self-respect from him. They wanted to take everything from him so that when it was done and he was dead and gone, his disciples would look at that all and say, I got nothing. They didn't leave anything left. The followers on the periphery would look at Jesus and they, somebody would talk about his teachings and they'd say, ah, I got nothing. They took it all. That's why I like the Passion. Now, I would never recommend going to see the Passion and watching the crucifixion scene like I did from the third row. That's a little too much crucifixion, okay? That's all I'm saying. But they were the only seats available, and I got free movie tickets out of it, so it works. As Mel Gibson sort of catches the fact that they take absolutely everything from him, and more to the point, he gives everything up for our redemption. All of it. And John goes on to say that Jesus is not just an example to be admired, but an act to be imitated. Now, John's not stupid. He knows that rarely ever are we called to lay down our lives for other people. Because you were all here last week, right? Most of you? Most of you were here last week. Some of you weren't. Mm. And while you're all here this week, and then next year, next week, most of you will be here. Right? And you know why? Because nobody in the room is going to be called on, probably, to lay down their life for somebody else. It just doesn't happen. But we can, in a million other ways during the week, sacrifice and give to those around us. To find ways that love that may cost us and be sacrificial. Love is the willingness to lay down that which has value for our own life to enrich the life of another. Let me just run that by you one more time. Love is the willingness to lay down that which has value for our own life to enrich the life of another. Love is neither sentiment nor talk, it is what? You people who've studied James, you know the answer to this question. Love is what? Deeds, right? Love is deeds. But sometimes, maybe a lot recently, sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we wonder when people start screaming at us and calling us names and telling us that we're something that we think we're not, but we're wrong and we just don't understand and things are just horrible and they're yelling at us and yelling at us and then we think, you know, sometimes I do stuff and I don't have the purest of motives and I'm a little confused and I begin to doubt and I have questions and my conscience afflicts me. And you know something that hasn't changed since John put pen to papyrus. John writes about it and it hasn't changed. In centuries it hasn't changed. Sometimes our consciences get the better of us and sometimes our conscience can be wrong. Our emotions will fail us from time to time. Some of you are old enough to understand that. 
To those of you who are not, John gives a couple of words of advice. When we doubt, John says we know two things. We know, firstly, that we are the truth. And that seems like a pretty incredible claim. But Jen, you're getting into that Johannine language thing, I and me, thee and thee and me, and I and the Father. And <clears throat> Let's make it real simple this morning. Did you ask Jesus into your heart? Did you do that? And Jesus is dwelling in your heart, right? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the truth. <clears throat> Where's the truth? It's in here, right? It's in here. Regardless of what's coming at us from out here, the truth of Christ is in here. And if we know the truth and we know Jesus, who does John say we know? God the Father, right? So the second thing is that we know God. We know the truth because Jesus is in here and we know God. And for John, it means that the knowledge of God alone can quiet our hearts. You understand that? The knowledge of God alone can quiet our hearts. So where, where does the knowledge come from? And you, you read the passage and you probably glossed over it because you think oh, it doesn't really belong there. And all of a sudden, John starts giving advice on prayer. How silly is that? How silly is that? The knowledge of God comes from the words of Jesus spoken to your heart bringing you the truth because you are the truth. And if Christ is in you, you are in him, and the words bring truth. So how do you get a hold of that? The only way I know is to pray. The only way I know is for you to be quiet enough to hear the words that Jesus speaks in the depths of your heart. And when Jesus does that, John says, your heart will cease to be troubled. And if your heart is not troubled, then you get two blessings out of it. I don't often talk about blessings. Some of you talk about it all the time. You live the most amazing and incredible lives, talking about all the blessings all the time. But John talks about two, and one of them, the first one, if you have an untroubled heart, is that you have communion with God. And the second one is that God will answer us. And isn't it interesting that once <clears throat> we are afflicted by conscience and once we relieve ourselves of that conflict, our prayer life comes back online. Your doubt will evaporate, my friends, in the hour of prayer. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and try it this week. If all the media that you're watching, all those news sources with all those stupid letters out in front of them or words, gets after you and, and you're sitting here wondering if you're doing the right thing or if you're doing what, anything at all or if you're something that you're not and it all creeps in, <clears throat> I dare you, I double dog dare you to go to God in prayer. You got health issues this week and your heart's troubled, you go to prayer. You go to work this week and you got people who don't want to be around you and would rather you not be around them and things are troubled, you go to prayer. Go to God in prayer and see if you do not find the words that speak to your heart and calm your spirit. See if Jesus does not answer you in that hour. Test God this week and see. Because John says he is in us and we are in him. We know this from the very words of Jesus that he told in the allegory of the vine and the branches. So what does it mean for today? That was the hard thing is to tie this all up because I could be really, really specific today. And I could offend almost all of you in a single swoop. And I'm not going to do that today. I want to tell you that love is hard instead. Love is hard. 
And when Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. And my friends, <clears throat> those are good words, right? Men and angels can say some really amazing things and say some, some wonderful things and say righteous things and say just things. But if people are hurt in the process of the saying of those things, if hate is disseminated in the preaching of those words, then they are not words of God. You got what I'm saying? We are about redemption. We are about redeeming people. No one is expendable in God's economy. And we are about saving lives, not destroying them. It's easy to yell and to scream and to point fingers and complain and to gossip. It's hard to love. It is just hard to love. Because you cannot love anonymously. You got that? If you're parents, you understand. If you are married, you understand. You cannot love anonymously. I'm not sure at what point you all realize that your spouses were not perfect. Please don't ask my wife when she discovered I was not. And your kids, I don't think, are perfect either. I don't think there's anybody here who threw their kids away. You loved, well, okay, if you did, don't, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. You love them anyway. And you love them in such a way that you're hoping for redemption. You understand, when I, when I marry people, they stand before me, and they look at each other, and they've got that dead cow eye stare. <sighs> and you can't tell them anything. That's why I usually don't do premarital counseling anymore, because they're not listening anyway. I'll catch them on the flip side when things start going wrong. And when I look at them and very seriously and tell them is, you are about to teach your spouse what the love of God really looks like. Because you're going to love them on their good days and their bad days. You're going to lump them all the time. And you're going to give them a concrete example, right? A concrete example of what the redemptive God of love looks like. If not, you got something you can go home and work on. Jesus did not love anonymously, and neither can you. Jesus loved you. Jesus loves you in particular and died for you in particular. And that's how we love. And that's who you are, right? That is who you are. We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for another. As a pastor in the annual conference, Reverend Burns, and she's pastor over east side of Knoxville where they had a school shooting this past week. And she was kind of pulled into the middle of all of that. And she's also been meeting with the cabinet. And they've been talking about <clears throat> race issues. And um, district superintendent was looking at her as they were having their discussions. And district superintendent, you'll, you'll know which district superintendent immediately said, um, I live in Giles County. I don't think we have any black people in Giles County. What am I supposed to do? And she said, well, there are all kinds of things that are suggested out there. And Reverend Burns has heard them all. And you know what she suggested? She suggested two things. She said, you find you somebody who doesn't look like you, doesn't act like you, and in the same place as you. I don't know if she'd go so far as to tell a Republican to find a Democrat or a Democrat to find a Republican, but that'd be pretty radical these days. So you go find somebody. Maybe they're black. And she said, 
I would suggest. She said make a friend. I would say love them. Because that goes with the sermon this morning. And maybe the place to start is you go find somebody and love them. And I thought, boy, where's that been? Where has that been for the last 16 months? Where has that been? So, you're all going to stand up this morning? Stand up. Now I'm going to send you forth. You're all going to go find somebody to love this week. Every last one of you is going to go find somebody. You're going to go find somebody that doesn't look like you, doesn't act like you, is nothing like you. And you're going to say, well, Pastor, that's awful hard. No kidding. No kidding. Love is hard. Love is hard. You've been married any length of time, you know that. You raise kids, you really know that. No amens. Don't, don't do that. No. <laughs> especially, especially if your kids are here. Oh, no, don't, don't give me an amen. Um, go find somebody to love. And love them like Jesus would love them. And go spread some eternal life, will you? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go ahead, David. We're going to sing. As the ushers dismiss you. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. Though the light of your love is shining, though in the midst of the darkness shining, Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth. You now bring us shine on me. Shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence. From the shadows into your radiance, by the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, shine Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Let our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let